Hello and welcome. We're delighted to have you join us. My name is Catherine Bayston, and I'm the project manager for the Partnership for Expanding Education Research in STEM, or PEERS, Data Hub at the Inner University Consortium for Political and Social Research, ICPSR. The PEERS Data Hub is funded by the National Science Foundation, and it's a collaborative initiative with the American Educational Research Association, AERA, and ICPSR. The Peers Data Hub features ways to explore and discover data sets for secondary research and analysis, avenues for connecting with colleagues and like-minded researchers, and resources for data and research management. If you would like to know more and also register for upcoming webinars for free, such as this one, please visit the Peers Data Hub at www.peersdatahub.net. This webinar will introduce you to concepts in which incorporating real data can help students feel more connected to the materials and give them valuable experience for embarking on their own future research projects. This webinar will introduce participants to tools and resources available through ICPSR and provide suggestions for ways that they could be used to convey or supplement context in the typical research methods courses. The very brief introduction to the secondary data types and topics represented in the ICPSR collection will also be presented. Before we hear from our presenter, I just want to remind you that one of PEER's features is a data discovery page where you can find links to the resources discussed today, as well as many more. Now, today we are hearing from Dr. Lynette Holter, the archivist at ICPSR. Lynette Holter is an archivist at ICPSR, where she serves as Director of Instructural, Instructural Resources, Director of the Consortium Social Science Archive, and Director of the National Archive of Data on Arts and Culture, NADA. She has taught courses in research methods and statistics at both the graduate and undergraduate levels in several different programs. Common across Lynette's work is the desire to help individuals find, access, and use the data that best fits their needs and to foster quantitative literacy in students and others. Lynette has a PhD in sociology from Penn State University. I would like to say, say thank you in advance to Dr. Holter and also thank you for the attendees here and their contributions. Dr. Holter, the floor is yours. Thank you so much. As Catherine said, um, I'm Lynette Holter, and I wear a number of hats at ICPSR, but I get to talk to you today about one of my favorites, which is to tell you a little bit about who ICPSR is overall, but to talk mainly about how we might spice up teaching those courses that, um, I don't know about you, but I love to teach, but students don't always love to take. Um, and so I found that using data or using data related tools can actually help engage students with the material um, in a bit deeper way and make the courses a little bit more interesting for them. Um, we, we, um, my background, as Catherine mentioned, is in sociology and uh, most undergrads in sociology have to take a research methods and or a statistics course. And most of them say, but I'm not going on to grad school. Why is this even relevant? Um, and even when we're teaching in graduate school, um, students don't even always wanna be in that research methods class. There's lots more substantive stuff that they wanna learn. Um, so hopefully uh, you'll get a few tips today to uh, think about ways um, maybe to change up how you might teach specific concepts in your research methods class. Um, before we turn to that, I thought I'd do a little bit of, um, like I said, an introduction to ICPSR, a little bit of stage setting, um, and then uh, I'll talk to you about finding and using data in our catalog, as well as using the tools that we have available um, around the data. So if you're not familiar with ICPSR, um, ICPSR is one of the world's oldest and largest social sciences uh, social and behavioral sciences data archives. Um, and we we define that pretty broadly. Um, 
I think last time we checked, uh, the, our users covered about 50 different disciplines. So um, don't let the let the fact that we um, have social and behavioral sciences in our title sort of um, make you think that there isn't uh, data for education research, for example. Um, we do have quite a bit of data across all um, disciplines and education is definitely well represented. Most people know us because of our website, um, if they're using data from ICPSR or because of our summer program in quantitative methods of social research. I won't be talking about those, I won't be talking about the summer program today, but I did put a link in the slides. Um, and these slides will be made available to you as Catherine mentioned um, after the webinar. So you'll notice as we go along, there are lots and lots of links so that you can find the things that I mentioned without having to worry about writing it down as we're going. Um, yeah, so just a quick couple other quick tip, um, tidbits about ICPSR. We are over 60 years old. We were founded in 1962. Um, and the summer program started right after that in the summer of 1963, because the founders realized that just making data available to people was not enough. We had to help sometimes help people use the data and think about um, the methods for analyzing the data or collecting new data, things like that. Um, we currently have just over 20,000 what we call studies, which is made up of one or more uh, data set. Often people hear the term study and they think of a publication or something like that. Um, we here at ICPSR use the term to mean um, it's our basic container. Um, so uh, a study might be one data set, it might be multiple data sets that are all related to each other, but um, hopefully that will become clear as we go through the webinar. Um, we also have many of our studies marked up at the variable level, so you can actually search more than 6.5 million variables, um, which makes it one heck of a um, question bank um, if you're thinking about teaching social uh, research or education research. Um, and linked to the data in our catalog, we have uh, just about, um, well, almost 115,000 publications. And I should note that ICPSR is um, what we call a consortium. The C stands for a consortium. Um, of over 820 member institutions. I think we're right about 823 right now. Um, and I put a link here to the list of member institutions. If you're not sure if you're at a member institution, you can go ahead and, and check the link. Um, most schools in the United States, uh, most research intensive schools, that is, um, are ICPSR members. Um, many others are as well. So. Um, Everything that, um, I think everything that I will be talking about today is available, whether you're at a member institution or not, um, with the exception of um, some of the data um, and some of the online analysis, um, online analysis tools for the data that are only available for uh, members. And I'll, I'll tell you how to identify that as we go. There are lots and lots of different places that you can get data. Um, you can just do a Google search and, and often you'll find data. Um, ICPSR's catalog is indexed in Google, um, but ICPSR is a little bit different than um, maybe a, a repository that your institution might have or um, some other places that you can go um, to get data online. I mentioned that we have a long history. Um, and one of our key uh, pieces to our mission is that we work on preserving the data so that people can use it over time. Um, and you might think about the technological changes that have happened over the last 60 years. Um, we wanna make sure that the data that people deposited 20 years ago and the data that people might deposit today are both equally useful um, 20 years in the future. We have broad disciplinary coverage, as I mentioned. Um, in addition to the studies that are in our holdings, um, we actually also point to data that are held elsewhere. Um, if there are important data that we know of that, for example, a government agency makes available or um, a data provider might make available, um, we, we 
we'll try to point you to that. So we try to be a one-stop shop as you're looking for data. Um, we also have curated and self-published studies, and I'll talk a little bit about the difference um, between those two things in the next slide. Um, but overall, uh, curated data are well-documented. Um, we actually have a staff of professional curators who um, try to make sure that there's enough information around each of our studies that somebody who's not from the original research team can still responsibly use those data. Um, that's where the, the study and variable level metadata is created. Um, and most of our data are available in the statistical packages, the most common statistical packages in the social and behavioral sciences. So most of our data are available in R, SAS, SPSS, STATA, and some of them have online analysis capabilities. Um, and we also um, let people know, and this is particularly important for people who are thinking about sharing data with us, but it's also helpful for you if you're looking at data, um, you can see how many other people have downloaded a particular study. Um, so you might choose one that's really um, popular uh, because other people are using it, or you might choose one that doesn't have quite so much use um, because maybe you'll have less of a chance of getting scooped, who knows? Um, just a little bit of vocabulary, um, just to make sure that we're all kind of on the same page because different disciplines use the same words slightly differently sometimes. Um, the first one is just the distinction between data and statistics. Um, often, particularly with students, we have students coming to us asking for data when what they're really looking for is sort of a summary table or um, a, a chart or something. Um, we consider that statistics. We have the underlying raw data. Um, so I like to say ICPSR does data so that you can do the statistics. So if you're looking for things like um, a chart of, um, I don't know, the um, high school graduation rate over time in a particular area, um, we may have the data that will help you find that, but we won't have the chart necessarily. Um, Another word pair that um, is definitely different across disciplines, used differently across disciplines is quantitative and qualitative. Um, sometimes people use these to describe uh, particular questions. Um, for example, a fact question might be considered quantitative and a, an opinion question might be considered qualitative. Um, or a closed-ended question might be considered quantitative and an open-ended qualitative. Um, for the most part, ICPSR uses these terms to describe the data types themselves. So for us, qualitative, sorry, let me start with quantitative data, um, which is what most of our data are, um, are numeric. Um, they might have started as words, but they're um, in the, the data set, they're numbers. Um, and qualitative data is basically anything that's not numeric. So text or images, things like that um, would be qualitative data. Um, sometimes, and we do have data sets that represent this, qualitative data can be turned into quantitative data through coding. Um, and we do have some studies that were qualitative, but the data set that was deposited with ICPSR is sort of the, the resulting codes. So it's quantitative. And, um, we do have some cases where we put out data that um, get labeled as qualitative because they're answers to open-ended questions that were within a survey. Um, so if you, um, I'll show you how to do some searching and if you're searching and, and looking for qualitative data and you get survey data, um, you might look for a file, usually it's a CSV file um, that just has answers to open-ended questions. Um, we consider that qualitative. Um, and I mentioned um, that we have both curated and self-published data. Curated data is, um, like I mentioned, we've got um, a staff of people who go through and check for codes that look like they're out of, um, out of range, or uh, they make sure that the documentation actually matches the data. They're formatted for the different statistical packages. They create the information around the data. Um, Self-published, we have um, 
open ICPSR, which is what this slide links to. Um, and basically that is whatever uh, a data provider deposits is what you get. And so there are some studies in open ICPSR that are really well documented and easy to use and other data where people shared it because they were required to and they shared the bare minimum. Um, I think I, I have, I don't think, I know I have come across some studies in open ICPSR where it's literally just the data set, no code book, no um, additional information about the study itself. So um, what I'm gonna be talking about today is primarily um, from our curated collection, um, but I wanted you to know that we do have self-published data as well. So just thinking about what you can get at ICPSR, I mentioned where um, social and behavioral sciences really broadly defined. Um, we've primarily got data about individuals throughout their life course. So um, everything from early childhood through the elderly um, and actually opinions on both ends of the opinions and behaviors about both ends of the life course. So um, kind of pushing that boundary. Um, we do also have uh, data about institutions like schools and colleges and universities, hospitals, police um, departments, things like that. Um, we cover uh, a wide time period. Um, the, I have a link here to our oldest study, which is about public executions in England um, from 1194 to 1294. Obviously, most of our data is much more recent than that. Um, so I would guess that um, most of our collection is at least um, mid 1800s forward. Um, we have primarily survey and other raw data types, like I mentioned, uh, administrative data, things like that. Um, we have both public and restricted use data. So some of our data have um, things in them that, that um, either could make it easily, it could raise the risk of potentially identifying a respondent, um, or it might contain sensitive information. And this is particularly true for education data. Um, some of it might be um, data about kids and topics that, um, you know, might, it might not be good if people, um, for example, uh, one of the studies that's popping into my head is monitoring the future where they ask about drug use among um, eighth, 12th, 10th and 12th graders. Um, obviously that's information, some of that information is pretty sensitive. Um, so some of those files are restricted. In that case, we do have public versions of those data as well. Um, we also are incorporating lots and lots of new data types. Um, we do have image data, um, for example, brain scans. Um, we've got other qualitative data like unstructured interviews or videos. Um, and we have a, a social media data archive that just launched about a year ago. Um, and that contains data either from or about um, social media platforms. So we're incorporating these data types. Um, if you know that you want qualitative data, we might not be the best place for you to start. Like I said, we are primarily quantitative. We've got a little bit of qualitative and we're working to incorporate even more. Um, but if you know that you wanna start with qualitative, you might look at, um, for example, the qualitative data repository um, instead. Um, just like it's helpful to know what you might find, um, it's helpful to know what you typically won't find. Um, so I mentioned you won't, generally find summary charts or tables of data, answers to quick Google questions, things like that. Um, people often try to use our search as they would use Google. Um, and we'll give you, uh, we'll return search results that may or may not help you answer the question, but we won't give you the answer itself. Um, you won't find identifiable information about individuals or organizations. We, re we take uh, respondent confidentiality pretty seriously. And so we remove that information. Um, for the same reason, you also won't find a lot of data to be used in GIS or other mapping packages. Often one of the first things that gets stripped out of public use data is um, the geographic, uh, anything, um, for example, federal data is often uh, restricted to census region or above, so not even state um, level. 
Uh, some of our restricted data obviously has more granular geographic identifiers, um, but most of our public use data does not. So if you're looking for data to use in mapping packages, again, we're not the, pla the best place to start. Um, this is just a list of, I did a quick, um, uh, a quick look the other day at what people have downloaded um, most recently, our fiscal year runs um, July 1st to June 30th. So I did the last fiscal um, year, the one that ended about a month ago. And these were the studies that um, were most heavily downloaded. And I include this only because um, it shows a good representation of the breadth of our collection. Um, and again, all of these are linked. So if you see something that looks interesting, um, you will have the links to these uh, when you get the slides. So thinking about using data in um, teaching research, either research methods or research design, whatever your um, different uh, institutions call it different things. Um, there are a couple guidelines to kind of keep in mind. In general, using data, we know um, boosts qu students' quantitative skills, and that's a good thing. Um, those are one of the, the skill groups that um, employers often look for. Um, and using data in just about any form um, does show an effect on, those, on students' quantitative skills. It also tends to engage students more with um, the content, they have better recall and better understanding of what they're learning because they're, um, because using data is often um, by definition an active learning approach. Um, you've got students doing some of the hands-on work, uh, kind of wading through the data. Um, it provides opportunities for thinking critically in a variety of contexts. Um, we know and again, my background is in sociology, but um, the scientific method is the same in sociology as it is in, in biology, but students don't often realize that, that some of the concepts that they might've learned in biology are the same kinds of things that they're talking about in sociology. And so using data um, allows them to see that uh, the concepts can be used in a, a wide variety of different contexts. Um, and it also creates bridges between substantive and technical courses. And here by technical, I mean the research methods or the statistics kind of courses, research design, um, the courses where you're teaching students how to do research compared to the courses where they're learning about substantive content. Um, and the, the bridge works both ways, right? So if you use data in a substantive course, it helps students to see, oh, okay, this, now I understand why I have to take these research methods courses. And the research methods courses are actually a great way to sort of sneak in some um, substantive content. Um, I've taught uh, statistics for both um, urban planning students as well as um, sociology and criminal justice undergrads. Um, but in that case, the, the statistics class was a um, sort of a public service class. So students across the university could take it. Um, and by choosing examples that were based in sociology, it was a way of incorporating that substantive content back into the technical course. Um, and really for me, it's just more fun when you use data. So we do know that there are some best practices um, for using data. And this, this is whether you're using, having students actually in the data themselves, or if you're just using charts or, or graphs from the data, things like that. Um, students do need scaffolding in their learning, even graduate students. Um, but the key thing to remember is often we try to do, particularly in courses where we know that students may be anxious, um, like a statistics course, um, we tend to scaffold a little bit too much. Um, uh, we did a, a project um, on quantitative reasoning at ICPSR, and one of the instructors who was using data in her classroom discovered um, essentially that her students got really good at following directions but not so great at being able to, um, if, she if she took the directions away, they couldn't then interpret the table or um, do what she was asking 
um, without the directions because they became so dependent on that. So um, the scaffolding goes both ways. You have to have it at the beginning, but then you have to take pieces away so that students learn to um, interpret and think on their own. Um, emphasizing process or understanding um, rather than specific numbers or facts um, is a good pedagogical practice no matter what you're teaching, but especially around the use of data. Um, maybe not asking students exactly what percent of people said X, but asking them to describe a pattern or something like that. Um, incorporate a sense of discovery, um, and that's I'll show you some ways that you can do that in the research methods course using ICPSR tools, um, but sort of let students kind of drive where they're going. Um, it's also been shown that uh, group or collaborative work, even if it's a think, pair, share kind of thing, is super useful in teaching um, statistics and research methods because it allows students to think through things themselves as they're trying to explain it to their partners. Um, and and uh, several um, publications have shown uh, much greater learning gains when students have to um, work with each other rather than just learning from uh, the instructor. Um, if you can use data that are related to current events or personal interest for students, um, if you're having them look up uh, information about uh, a school district, for example, maybe allow them to use their home school district. Um, anything that gives them a, kind of a buy-in um, will automatically increase their engagement and therefore their learning. So uh, just a quick intro into the ICPSR catalog. Um, often people, uh, if I'm talking to someone, um, about ICPSR, they imagine us as sort of a big Excel spreadsheet maybe, or a big um, database. I like to say that ICPSR is much more like a library. Um, so just like in a library where you've got books on the shelf, but you need to use the tools of the library um, website to find a particular tool or find a particular book or uh, publication, um, identify whether it's gonna work for you, figure out how to get it, and then you get the actual um, item that, you're, that you requested. Um, ICPSR is the same thing just for data. So we have the same kind of structure like a library. Um, we've got lots of studies. They're grouped by type or by topic. Um, we've got an, a website that allows you to kind of dig into that and the information around the studies that allow you to decide whether those the particular study is right for your needs. And then we give you um, access to those data. So we try to make it as easy as possible to find what you need. Um, and if you're at a computer and want to play along, um, feel free to go to www.icpsr.org. Um, and you'll see uh, this is a screenshot of our Find Data tab. Um, and you can either go in to find data or you can actually start your search anywhere on the ICPSR website. All of our, our web pages are gonna have the search box in the upper left corner. Um, and from there, you can type in a keyword or anything that you want and you'll get um, search results. And just a word about these search results. And I tried to do, I tried to use examples here that are related to education. So um, hopefully uh, maybe you might even find something interesting just in the examples. Um, but so here I looked for scholarships. Um, I wanted to see if um, what data we had about scholarships. Um, and I wanted to limit it to data that were curated. Um, and so I used minus open ICPSR and that takes out the self-published data. Um, again, there's great stuff in the self-published data, um, but a lot more variability what you get um, in terms of the, the information around the data themselves. Um, so once you get a search results page, um, you can use filters on the left-hand side or facets, whatever you wanna call them. Um, and I listed a couple of the ones that people find most helpful on this slide. So um, restriction type, which you can see is the third filter down. 
Um, that'll let you know if um, the data are public or restricted. So if you want to limit your search to only data that are publicly available, which means that you can download them on your, your computer and get to work right away, um, you can do that. Just select public. Um, you might find some studies that have both public and restricted data in that search, um, but every study that is returned in your results will have at least one data set that's public. Um, data format, if you've got a particular statistical package that you like or you want to use online analysis because you're using it in class and you don't want to have to teach students uh, a statistical package, you can use the data format facet and choose that there. Um, time period allows you to choose um, if you want, for example, recent data or if you want older data, um, you can put in the time period that you're looking for. Um, and I listed time method here. People sometimes get confused between time method, time period, and recent releases. Um, time method is whether the data, essentially whether the data are longitudinal or cross-sectional. We have lots of different words that we use for both. Um, but if you know that you want data looking at the same people over time, for example, then you might choose the longitudinal time method. Um, and then uh, the last um, facet that I wanted to mention is data availability. And that's where I noted at the beginning that some of the data are available to um, people at member institutions and some are not. Um, Actually, that's not quite true. If you're not at a member institution, you can still get members only data. Um, you just have to pay for it. Um, so if you know that you're not at a member institution um, and you want data that's freely available, then go ahead and choose public in data availability. Um, there's also in the middle of the screen of search results, you can toggle so that you can see the summaries that our curation staff have written about each of the studies right on the on your in your search results. Um, we have that turned off by default because some of them are quite lengthy, um, but you can turn that on so that you don't even need to jump out from the, the search results to get an idea of what each study is about. Um, and then there are a variety of different ways of sorting data as well. And so I just wanted to point that out. Um, when you put a search term in that search box, um, it actually searches a couple different things. Um, so the first tab that you get, the one that we were just looking at, is the studies. So that's searching all of the information that we have about the data, the title, the um, uh, the summary description, um, as well as also searching code books and any other documentation that's associated with the studies. Um, and our curators tag each of the studies with subject terms. It's searching that as well. Um, the next tab over is variables. And I mentioned that a good chunk of our collection, um, well over 75% of our collection is marked up at the variable level which means that you can actually search the, the particular um, questions within a survey, for example. Um, and there it's searching, um, it's looking for whatever you put in the search box in the variable name, label, question, text, or answer categories. Um, and then a little bit further over, you can see data-related publications. And there it is searching um, for your keyword in any of the fields that are in the citation, so the title, the journal title, things like that. Um, if we have the abstract and have put it in our database, it will also search that. It's not searching the full text of the publication. Um, so that's just something to keep in mind. Um, we have a couple different search tools, which I'll talk a little bit more about as we go, because they're also great teaching tools. Um, but if you know that you want to look for variables rather than studies to begin with, um, go ahead and start with the search compare variables tool. Um, and again, that's in the, the find data drop down menu. If you want to start with a publication, um, you can start with the data related publication searches. Um, and that'll uh, allow you to find the publication itself, as well as um, it'll link back to the data that were used to create that publication. 
ICPSR has a number of what we call thematic data collections. Often these are funded by external entities um, who have some say in what goes in the collections. Um, but if you have a broad interest in a, a topic area like criminal justice or the arts or um, uh, child and family data, um, uh, we've got a resource center for, um, yeah, resource center for minority data, also known as really cool minority data, things like that. Um, you can start at the find data, um, and click on thematic data collections and then under data collections, explore our data collections by topic and you'll get a page that lists each of the um, topical archives or thematic collections. And you can use um, the links there to go to the, um, the pages and just take a look at what's available there. Um, one thing to note is if you're on one of those pages, um, for example, if you find, um, yourself interested in uh, demographic data maybe. And so you go to the data sharing for demographic research page and you start a search on that page. It's only searching the things that are tagged with that um, particular thematic archive as the owner. So um, you might, if you don't find quite as many results as you think you should, back out and do your search on a main ICPSR page um, using the, the search box in the in the top um, and you'll probably get more results. I just wanted to give you a sense of um, some example studies that are related to education topics. Um, and I put here links to the actual studies themselves, but I also gave you a link to the search that I used um, that came up with some of these studies. And the searches include both curated and uncurated data, that self-published data. Um, so for example, there are a lot of good studies about um, school curricula in um, open ICPSR. I didn't list any of them here, um, but this search, uh, the link will rerun that search and give you those results. Um, and the, the search terms that I used are what are in quotes. Um, I just wanted to, Again, just give you some examples of things that are pretty uh, common as well as things that are less well known. Um, we do have a fair amount of international data related to education. So if you're interested in that, I put a couple examples on here. Um, we have old data. So the students in secondary schools in France is from um, records from 1864. Um, so just things that you might um, might or might not be interested in. Um, again, higher education, um, the American College Catalog Study Database looks at course descriptions and things from college catalogs. Um, uh, we've got a number of studies relating to campus climate, whether it's sexual assault or diversity on campus, things like that. Um, uh, teachers and students, um, lots and lots of data. Again, um, the Measures of Effective Teaching Project is, um, it's a series of videos, classroom observations that are also tied to surveys and other data. Um, most of that is restricted, so you would have to apply to access it, um, but I just wanted to let you know that it's there. Um, yeah, and if uh, just a word about the numbers that are in parentheses, ICPSR gives a study number to every one of our studies, and that's what um, what I put in parentheses because you can search just by the study number if you don't want to type in the full um, full text if you're not using the link. Um, and for example, the the teacher quality grants in Texas, we have two different um, time spans, so I put a link to both of the studies. Um, again, uh, information that's about students, um, and this is about specifically about student um, student schooling information. So we have um, a number of studies where um, students are the sort of the sampling group, um, but it doesn't maybe ask as much about the school itself or. Um, uh, 
school climate or, or something like that. It might ask just about students' behavior, maybe a little bit about educational aspirations. Um, the the um, studies that I picked here are more about um, the student and their, their life in school. Um, and then finally, um, we have a number of studies that allow you to look at students over time, um, either repeated cross sections like the Monitoring the Future survey where they, um, they've interviewed uh, eighth, 10th and 12th graders since the 1960s, I believe. Um, uh, and you can use those data sets. Um, there are things like the high school longitudinal study that follows a particular set of students over time. Um, high school and beyond. Uh, so each of these allow you to look at either the same or different cohorts of students over time. Okay, so if you're thinking about using um, data in the classroom, um, whoops, just trying to do two things at once and look at something that was in the chat and I should know not to do that. Um, <laughs> if you're Thinking about using data in your classroom, um, you might think about, well, how do I choose a good data set? Um, and obviously topic is probably gonna be your first, um, first priority. Um, anything, if you're not wedded to a particular topic, anything about students or around the age of your students um, is usually something that students are interested in. Um, but you might say, well, I wanna use data in the classroom, but I just want students to run maybe a basic correlation or something like that. I don't wanna to have to teach them a statistical package. Um, we have about 1500 studies that have online, and online analytic capabilities, and I linked those here. Um, you wanna think about, especially if you're teaching a research, me a research methods or statistics class, um, you also wanna think about are there enough variables and cases for students to do what you're going to want them to do? So um, if you want them to compare across different groups of people, can they do that? Is there enough variability in the sample? Um, if you want them to be able to use the same data set, for example, in a statistics class that starts at uh, basic frequencies and ends at regression, are you going to have the interval ratio level variables that you need? And if they're not already in the data, can you create scales from the variables that are there so that you can use them as interval ratio? Um, it's also completely fair, and I would um, I would advocate that you think about the ease of your use of the data um, before you choose them for use in class. For example, are you gonna have to do a lot of work to the data before you share it with your students? Um, and uh, so you might, the, that kind of work might include um, defining missing values so that they're taken out of statistical analyses. Um, it might include recoding variables if you're if you've got something that has a lot of different answers and you want to collapse the categories together, or if you've got variables that you want to put into a scale, but some of them are coded so that high scores mean less of the thing and some are coded so that high scores mean more of the thing. Are you gonna have to reverse those? That kind of thing. Um, is there enough question text or descriptive variable labels that the students will know what the, um, the information is about without you having to constantly answer the questions? That kind of thing is totally, um, totally valid to think about when you're thinking about choosing a data set for class. And I should say, um, in general, if you're using data in class, we advocate um, that each student download their own version of the data. However, if the data that you choose does require some of that fiddling um, so that you need to create new variables or recode categories, things like that, um, it is permissible for you to download a version of the data and put it on um, like a a Canvas or a other course um, management website um, and share it only with your students. Um, so that is allowed. I would advocate that you can use data in the classroom without even using data. Um, so I like to think of this as using the packaging. Um, plus it just gives me an, an excuse to use a picture of one of my cats. 
um, who often finds the packaging much more interesting than whatever's inside it. Um, but I'll tell you a little bit about um, the kinds of packaging that we have and how they might be used in teaching. Um, so each of our studies has its own dedicated study homepage, and these are standardized for the, the curated data. Um, it'll tell you if it's part of a larger um, survey data collection or a larger data collection effort, doesn't have to be surveys. It'll also tell you right on that study homepage if, if any of the data um, sets are restricted. Um, but it also gives you information the, about the study itself, also about the sample, the universe, all of those, um, those buzzwords that you're teaching in class. Um, so if you're teaching unit of observation, for example, um, they can look at study homepages and find, find that. Um, each of the, um, uh, yeah, okay. <laughs> um, sorry, I was jumping ahead of myself. Um, you can use the study homepage to look at things like, is a particular method better for studying one um, particular topic? over a different method, for example. So I used um, school bullying as a search here. Um, and one of the studies that came up was um, a mixed method assessment of behavioral management strategies. And you could have your students take a look at something like this and read through the summary and think about how did they do the data collection. Um, so it talks about who was interviewed, um, the kinds of surveys that they did, whether it was a mailed questionnaire, self-administered, things like that. Um, and you can either start a search with the, the topic in mind, or you can um, take a look at the collection method facet on the left-hand side and start with a particular method. Um, the study homepage itself will also give you information about the variables that are in that study, if it's been marked up at the variable level. Um, so you can see this is a list of the variables that are included in this particular data set. Um, and if you click on the variable name, you'll get a frequency of um, a frequency table with if there's question text included, that'll show up. This study didn't have question text. Um, but it also shows you on the left hand side um, where the study or sorry, where the question falls within the the data set. So it shows you the questions around it, um, which are often really useful for providing context. Um, and you might use, for example, if you're teaching research methods and, and thinking about the question of race and ethnicity, which one you ask first, you might look at a couple of different studies and see how they order them and if whether it affects the responses, um, because we know that it does. The homepage will also give you a, a list of publications that we found that were based on the data. This doesn't mean that it's the um, an exhaustive list of what's been used for the data, but our librarians on staff are pretty good at finding things. Um, and they look for not only journal articles, um, but magazine articles, uh, anything in popular press, as well as books, presentations, white papers, things like that. Um, so it is a pretty exhaustive list in terms of um, the types of resources that they're searching. Um, and I actually like using um, research reports for students because they tend to be um, clearly written, short, and allow students to get a really good sense of what the study was about and what the main findings were. Um, they're more often more digestible than uh, journal articles. And I put a link here to a search within the bibliography um, for just research reports, um, if you're interested in using something like that. The um, data-related publication will also tell you if um, an article used uh, either multiple waves of the same study, for example, or um, different studies, uh, used together and it'll provide you a link to that other study so you could jump out and look at that. Um, we provide full text options and if you're at an institution that has access to those options, um, you'll be able to get full text right through your own library without ever leaving the ICPSR study homepage. Um, the codebook that 
goes with each of the studies includes information about the processing history, like what ICPSR may have done to the data. Um, it also includes uh, information about the study itself, the list of variables, the, the common things that you would find in a codebook. Um, I came across this one, which I loved. Um, this is an example from a page from the codebook that I just showed you. Um, and it, it is a really good way that students can see how you're um, naming variables and creating the coding scheme. Um, so I just, I just loved that, um, that you can show them that. I mentioned that so, um, several hundred of our studies, about 1500 have online analysis capabilities. Um, that's, you can access that right from the study homepage as well. Um, and this is just a screenshot of the um, frequencies and cross tabs in what we call full analytic capabilities or full SDA. Um, the interface is not super pretty. It looks like late 80s, early 90s web design, um, but you can actually do just about anything in this package that you can do in um, a typical statistical package. So you can do anything from univariate statistics up through um, multiple uh, OLS uh, logistic regression. Um, you can recode variables, uh, create scales, things like that. So if you're wanting to use data without having students um, engage a, a statistical package, you can use a, a study that has online, analy online analysis capabilities. Um, I use the online analysis tool to teach uh, levels of measurement. So we might look at different variables within a study um, and look at their frequencies and think about levels of measurement. Um, if you're just teaching things like uh, reading a cross tabulation table, um, which often takes students uh, a lot of repetition to get right, um, you can do that in SDA. I noted here you might want to use the modified SDA. It's the second option on that when you click um, Analyze Online, um, it's a more user-friendly interface. It's ADA compliant. Um, it allows you to drag and drop variable names in rather than having to click 100 times, um, things like that. Um, you can use it to teach uh, bivariate and multivariate regression or relationships it, because it requires students to identify independent and dependent variables. Um, you can show them the effect of weighting a study, for example, because um, it does allow you to, to use or not use weights in your analyses. Um, you can use the documentation overall, um, the study homepage, the codebook, the variables tabs to teach things like sampling, um, uh, thinking about variables. My students often have trouble thinking about what's a variable versus what's a value within a variable. So seeing them multiple times helps them solidify that. Um, if we're given interviewer instructions um, or any other supplemental documentation from the data provider, we include that for you as well. And so you can use interviewer instructions to, um, to talk about how to probe, for example, or how when not to probe. Um, response rate information is in there. Um, you could also ask students to come up with a research question and hypotheses using whatever data set you choose or have them choose uh, a data set um, and then <coughs> identify which would be the independent and dependent variables. Um, one of our search tools that does great double duty as a teaching tool is the search and compare variables tool or our social science variables database. Um, and this is a, a screenshot of the, the homepage, but again, um, you can get to the variable search just through the, the main search bar. Um, but it gives you so I did a search on um, the word scholarship and it gave me all the, the um, items where scholarship appeared in the variable name, label, question, text, or answer categories. And then I decided that I wanted to compare some of them. Um, so you can do this just like if you were buying a refrigerator at Home Depot. Um, so I chose three of them, I clicked compare, and this is the display that you get. So you can see that it shows you the, the actual variable name, the label, the question, a frequency distribution, 
Um, it tells you what study it was from. So if you find one that looks particularly interesting, you can jump out to that study and see what else is included. It gives you a time period for when the question was asked. Um, and then it tells you who was in the universe of the study. Um, I love to use the Social Sciences Variables database to teach operationalization, um, that topic that students' eyes usually just completely glaze over. Um, we look at different ways to, to ask even basic questions like income or age. Um, you can ask them with, with complete open-ended, you can give them categories, things like that. Um, again, levels of measurement. Um, it's also great for looking at the effects of different sampling, different samples or over time. If you find a similar question that's asked of a, a university sample and a um, national random sample, for example, you can compare the, the response um, breakdowns. Um, you can think about the differences in how people answer a question depending on how the data were collected. So if they have to talk to an interviewer, are their answers going to be different than if they write them down on a, um, a web survey themselves, for example. Um, this is also great for if you're creating a survey as a class or, or your students are creating it for their, um, their thesis or their dissertation. Um, you can use this as a question bank. Um, and it also, uh, if you're teaching survey creation, you can use it to look at things like um, uh, characteristics of the questions themselves. So if you have a Likert scale that has a middle category, how does that change the answer distribution compared to not having a middle category? Or what happens if you ask people about something um, uh, over time? Is their recall super accurate? Um, an example that I like to use of this um, is not education related necessarily, but it's from the National Survey of Family Growth, where they used to ask respondents, they may still, I just don't know, um, to go month by month for the past five years and talk about whether they were in a relationship, whether they were having sexual intercourse, and if they were using contraception, and if so, what. Um, and if you look at the, the data from those, you see that people change contraceptive, me contraceptive methods in January and June. Um, it's huge heaping issues. They know that they change somewhere in the winter or somewhere in the summer. They're just gonna pick one of those random months. Um, I also use the social science variables database when I teach something like family, for example, to talk about how how what we know is driven by what we ask or how we ask something. Um, so I had students take a look at marital status um, in the social science variables database and find out when um, cohabiting was included as a, as a response option. Um, and then we, we talked about, well, did people start cohabiting in the 70s and 80s? No. What do we know about them before then? Well, we don't because we didn't ask. Um, that kind of thing. Dr. We also, we're yep. In here. Um, so you want to wrap it up or, you know. Okay. I think I have about um, two more slides. Okay. Um, so we also have information about informed consent language. So if you're teaching students about um, collecting their own data, I linked that here. Um, confidentiality and disclosure risk reviews. I linked that here. Um, the guide to preparing data um, for sharing is great for a whole bunch of different reasons. Um, it includes information about creating data management plans, but it also talks about best practices for what information to keep as you're collecting data, how to structure your data sets, how to name your variables, that kind of thing. I linked that here as well. Um, and then we have a pre-registry of education-related studies, so um, students could read through those and see what people are, are planning to study. Um, and then using any of our data for replication. Um, so we've got the Education, data Re education Research Data Sharing Initiative. Um, I linked that here. We have several journal repositories um, where the data are deposited for the sole purpose of replication and you can use it in open ICPSR. Um, I just gave uh, an example of a um, different kind of capstone project. Um, 
I'm not going to read this to you. And I think that is all I wanted to say. Um, so I realized that I did not leave very much time for questions. <laughs> Are there any that ans that I can answer quickly? I can also stay on and I'm happy to answer questions afterward. Hi, Lynette. Um, actually, we've been answering lots of questions in the chat. So I think people's Perfect. main questions have been answered. I think we're good there. Perfect. Um, well, fortunately, we are out of time, so we'll need to stop here. But I want to thank Dr. Holter for sharing about the great resources and the archives and how she it can be used to teach students in research method classes. I also want to thank my colleagues, Allison and Anna, for their help uh, in, uh, in helping with this webinar and the chat, et cetera, and so forth. Uh, thank you so much for your attendance.